Thank you for appearing on the Nancy Stevens Show, talking to anyone who is anyone in the arts and entertainment world. And today I'm delighted to be joined by an actor who celebrates 43 years in showbiz, John Barr. Welcome to my show. Good morning, Nancy. Hello, my darling. Good morning. How are you? All right? I'm really good. It's so lovely to see you. It's been a very, very long time. Well, actually, I'm thinking, when did we actually first meet? It was when I was doing pantomime at Milton Keynes, wasn't it? It was. I think it was, what, 2011, 2012? No, ish. I was, I was on right. another radio station then. And right. uh, I think you yeah. very kindly stepped in at the last minute because I was let down by the leading lady, I think. She was ill. Oh. Yes, she was. Yes, I, I do. Yes, it was. It, Denise, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I know. So that's, wow. yeah, a, lot, a long time ago. A lot, a lot has happened. The world is a very different place now, isn't it? Oh, my God. It's, <laughs> it certainly <laughs> is. Oh, my God. But anyway, let's, let's, oh, not, but let's not dwell on all that now because, you know, we've got so much to talk about and, you know, I want to concentrate on, you know, how you've coped through all this, but also primarily focusing on your incredibly illustrious career. I mean, it's an extraordinary story, um, you know, proper rags to riches. Uh, I love the fact that, you know, you were a child actor, um, you know, you, you, you're not formally trained and you've been in the business for, you know, the business, the mad, crazy business that we call showbiz for 43 years. I mean, did you ever foresee that when you left school at 15 and a half and lied your way into uh, Jesus Christ Superstore to, uh, tour, how? Well, you know, I was always, I was saying to some, I did an industry talk, uh, an industry talk with two colleagues this week, and um, I was always in it for the long game. I always wanted to be an older actor, which of course now I'm 55, I am an older actor. Um, and, it, that, and it's true what all the older actors said when I, to me when I was younger, that as you get older, it gets harder to kind of stay in the game. Um, but, you know, I've taken care of my voice. Um, I've definitely had become a character, so I've lost my hair and all that kind of stuff. And I just embrace all those those things that make me that make me employable. You know, that's that's my strength. I, yeah, and I think the fact I think I mean certainly nowadays versatility seems to be what it's all about. You know, you are you are so it's your versatility and 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 and, and people of your ilk that have have done so well. It's because you've been able to turn your hand to pretty much anything. You're not a one trick pony. No, but you know, that's where I think I've been very blessed and, and I'm very grateful for that um, because I never, I just wanted to be in the theatre. So the idea that I've, I've made albums at Albie Road and that I've made five solo albums, that I went to do a, ca had a cabaret career in America, I did the cruise ships, I've seen the world. Um, you know, I, 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 students said, How, did I ever plan this? And I went, no, you can't plan that. You just have to kind of go, well, that door seems to have closed. I'll do this. And now I teach. I never thought I'd be a teacher and I love the teaching. Well, I think I think that, that old adage that uh, they say, if you want God to have a laugh, tell him your plans. Now, never was a truer word spoken than now, though. True. <laughs> so, so, I love, so tell us about your, the beginning, where it all began, because it's such a lovely story, you know, when you, when you say you left school and you lied about you know, you joined Sylvia Young. Tell us about that, because it's such a lovely, inspirational story, and you couldn't do that now. No, you couldn't do that now, no. Uh, no, and I, I regularly, because I, I was teaching a private student yesterday, he was 20, and I, and, and, um, I hadn't seen him in a while, um, and um, I said, what you've got to remember, Ben, I said, when I was 20, I was the first ever ch alternate Che Guevara in Vita, but Hal Prince put me into the show. I was 20 years old. Wow. Rhea Jones was 18, she was the alternate Ava. For Kathy Evans, we were so young, and they gave us they gave us these incredible chances, you know. Um, but at, at my primary school, I was always in the I always sang, and I was always the kid that they they pushed forward. And then as I got older, we moved houses when I was ten, and I went to my new primary school. And within two weeks, I got the lead in uh, Harry Norson's The Point. I played Obio. I think that was a, Mark Tripp, who'd been the star the year before playing the Scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz ended up playing my dog, Arrow. I don't think he was very happy about it. No, I'm sure he wasn't. <laughs> um, oh. And then I, when I went to, then I went, I went to my comprehensive school. Within the first year there, I played, was playing Louis and the King and I. 
Um, and then we did lots of concerts. There was an incredible music teacher there called uh, Douglas Shaw. He was very inspirational to me and wrote cantatas for me, which are like operas for children, called Willem and the Mouse and Wilhelmina and the Mouse. And, and we used to tour around all the local schools. I would always sing an assembly with my sister. By the time my, I was in my third or fourth year, when my sister joined the comprehensive school, I used to get up and sing, and I could see her sitting in her chair going, oh, no. I never used oh, to tell her I was singing, God. going, oh, no, yeah. it's my brother. <laughs> Embarrassing um, little brother, so yeah. There was, there was that, and then I, um, I was around my, my aunts one day with my nan, and I saw now my very dear friend Matthew Ryan on the front page of the New England Recorder. With that, he was starring in a play with Dennis Johns, and I said to my, my auntie Tina, I said, I want to be like him. Anyway, she had a word with my mum. My mum got me an audition for Sylvia Youngs. And the rest, as they say, is kind of history. I sang for Sylvie, but you've got a, a, a great voice. And I had this kind of crystal clear voice, soprano voice. Um, and, um, and then I did some shows with Sylvie. Um, and then Nick Berry, who then went on to become very famous, he's now again a very dear old friend of mine. He um, was in, a, in a, the vaudeville and the old, old time musical group. And he had a very bad accident on his bike. And I got shipped in to be his replacement. And then that really was the beginning of my, I suppose, the real beginning of my career where I sang solos and, and that how I learned. We used to do the shows around the old age pensioners' homes. And my big song at the age of 13 was, On this night of a thousand stars, singing to all the old ladies. <laughs> I bet they absolutely so, love that. They did. I mean, Frances Raphael, the original Eponine Les Mis was in it, and um, Claire Burt. Um, Nick Berry, Matt Ryan, who's now a very well-known director, Paul DeFreitas, who's a very famous casting director. We were all these amazing... Hi, Katty! <laughs> I just thought I'd put it down. Um, oh, God! So I was, I was, she has was to so, be the star of the show. That's fine, that's fine. But I was so lucky. And then, as I said, in my last year at school, I knew I wasn't going to pass any of these study exams anyway. And I, my friend Susie Fenix said, they're seeing people for the Tour of Superstar. So I auditioned them. For me, the main reason for going to this audition was it was the it was auditioning at the Prince of Wales Theatre, which is where Barbara Streisand made her debut in Funny Girl. I just wanted to sing on that stage. I was 15 and a half. I was already a huge Barbara Streisand fan at this point. So I got on there, sang my song, and they said to me, very good, how old are you? I'm at 19. I was 15 and a half. I lied about my age um, and got the job. And that was, and then at the age of 16, I toured around the country. And then I, um, I then went into the West End in Annie as the swing boy. I was 17. They took a big chance on me. And then the rest, and then I did the reps. After I did that, I did a lot of rep work, did a lot of telework. Um, I was incredibly lucky. I mean, kids these days, you know, I'm teaching 20, 22-year-olds that I'd already had quite a, an established career playing leading roles by that time. But I think, I think, obviously, things were different then. And I think, obviously, you had this prodigious talent that you know, you were in the, uh, uh, you were in the right place at the right, the right time. time. And, and yeah, and it is, you know, as we know in the biz of showbiz, it is very much about right place, right time, or who you know, and opportunities as well. And, and it is, as you know, it is so much harder. This cat is just absolutely <laughs> determined to. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. No, no, no. <laughs> you just love Zoom, hey? That's brilliant. I love it. Um, yeah, so, you know, so, and, and the thing is, it's different now. I mean, sort of, um, obviously, we'll, we'll talk about all the amazing things that you've done. But in terms of what advice would you give to youngsters now? Because my son, my, my youngest son is a second year addict in Leicester um, as a dancer. Right. And it's very different. You know, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, he, he auditioned for all the amazing colleges that you've worked with and he got places um, he got offers for those, but he, you know, he chose Addict because that's where he wanted to do it. it was a, a particular dance genre that he wanted to specialize in. Um, but it, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult now. You have to be at least, you know, doing three different things, actor, musician, singer at the very least, you know, or dancer. Yeah. I, it's so you're right. It definitely has got up harder. And I think the triple threat that, that, that funny word that we all see, I mean, I'm not a triple threat because I'm not a dancer. I mean, I, I've been in dance shows and I can, actually I can dance, but I'm not a dancer. And I pick up very, very slowly. But I was always wanted to be a singer, actor. And the kind of, the shows I've been in, have been, there's been choreography. Of, I mean, I have been in Cats, which is extraordinary really. And I did a chorus line, but it was on the radio. 
Chorus line. How, so how, I, does, how does that work on the radio? Chorus line on the radio. Well, I was incredible. John, I was part of the um, musical um, radio, BBC Radio 2 uh, musical series uh, company. I did four of them. I did um, Fiddle on the Roof with Anthony and Julius as Matevia. I did Jesus Christ Superstar with Roger Daltrey as Judas. And I did um, uh, uh, Kiss Me Kate with Julian McGuinness, the big opera star. And I did a chorus line with Donna McKechnie. He was the original amazing. cast. Yeah, I mean, amazing. And they basically, and then when John Langridge, oh, incredible. I mean, the, these people are just like the top of their game. But when John Langridge rang me and said, darling, he said, I love it that they pull in the chorus line. I said, I can't dance. He said, it's for the radio, dear. <laughs> oh, so, I love that. You know, so, that yeah. that's, a, that's a great story, chorus line on the radio. I do love I that. But that, that cast was incredible. Caroline O'Connor, David Soul was Zach. Um, Claire Moore was um, Maggie. I mean, the cast was extraordinary, extraordinary. And you have worked with some extraordinary people throughout your career. Um, who inspired you then and, and, uh, and who continues to inspire you now? Because has that changed? Um, no, not really. I mean, I was obsessed by Barbara Streisand and Dennis Stephen Sondheim at a very early age. Um, and then th th I've done a lot of Sondheim's work. I've done a couple of masterclasses with Sondheim back in the 80s when he was over here. Cameron got him. Uh, a place at Oxford, and then he did these new musicals. They're not musicals that he wrote, but that he mm. mentored George, An George and Anthony on, and, and uh, 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 some other great writers. And I was part of that company. Um, and, uh, you know, again, at a very early age, unlike a lot of the kids I teach now, I knew who Hal Prince was at the age of 12. You know, I saw him beat with Elaine Page about 12 times. I saw Sweeney Todd at Drury Lane over 70 times. I was upset. That is obsessive. Kids these, I know. Kids these days just don't get that experience. I mean, don't forget, in those days, I think it was £1.50 to stand, which is yeah. my pocket money gone. But I would stand at the back. And in fact, um, recently, just a 20-minute clip of the London production of Sweeney Todd has just been put on YouTube. And um, it just took me back there, because I, I remember it vividly. So, I mean, I just remember everything about that show going to the first pre and being so moved by it. I mean, I knew I wanted to play Tobias, and then at the age of 18, I got the role of Tobias, and um, I went up all the way up to Birmingham Rep to audition for it, and the director offered me the job on the spot, and I fainted. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I went, I went, I went, yeah, and now he's a very good friend of mine. He went, yeah, you actually passed out, which is going, oh, and I just went out. So I've done Sweeney Todd about four times in my career now. That's amazing, an incredible story. And Obviously, when we met, actually, which was, I said, back in, maybe it was before 2012. I don't know. Anyway, I, I, I lose track. But you were, um, we, I remember last time talking about the fact that you were in uh, Les Mis with the one and only Hugh Jackman. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, because, I mean, I, I was obsessed with Hugh Jackman then, and I'm still obsessed with Hugh Jackman. And he, he is, to me, he is the ultimate entertainer. Uh, Proper hoover, yes, you know, singer, dance, and he's just incredible. Tell me what that experience working on Les Mis was, you know, as Tom Hooper directing what, was like. Well, that was so weird because you get the phone call saying, you know, they want to see you for the film of Les Mis. So, and it was so weird because it must have been, it must have been, had I, I and this is why I'm getting it wrong where we're making, but I basically, I was um, about to start rehearsals for Pantomime. So I was on a Sunday. I was the last person of the day. I, I'll never forget it. I was auditioning at seven o'clock at the top of the Queen's Theatre. And I shaved my head because I was starting rehearsals on the following day. So I go in and I meet Tom Hooper, Cameron was there, John, uh, Claude Michel, Alan Bio. Um, there, were, there were a load of people there, producers. And it was like a room crowded with all these people. And then I never forget Tom Hooper saying to me, this is probably a very stupid question. He said, would you mind shaving your head? And I went, Like, you know, I, got, I shaved my head. I, so, um, and then I sang my song, I sang all the roles, and then I got a phone call saying, you've got the job. Um, and that was, and then basically they said to me, we don't want him to, uh, to shave or cut his hair until we start filming. And I said, well, that can't happen. I'm, I'm playing ugly that year. And I can't go on. <laughs> I mean, I know my dame or my, my um, ugly sister was quite ugly, but I think a bearded lady is taking it to a whole extreme. So anyway, I then started to um, grow my, my beard and everything, and I really looked like a homeless person. I looked terrible. And you did look like something from Castaway, didn't you? 
Yeah, no, but I get there on the first day of rehearsal. Remember, I hadn't shaved in nearly, nearly three and a half months, and I get this too tidy. And by this time, I'd lost out on two adverts because I looked like a tramp. And um, <laughs> I shaved all my hair off, and then they, they basically stuck on a beard. So I could have done these two adverts, which were very well paid. And anyway, <laughs> but the rehearsal process with Hugh Jackman, who can I just say, not only is he, of course, he's talent and he's, he is one of the nicest. He, there was only six of us in the room. There were all the, all the featured convicts and Hugh and Tom Hooper and Liam Steele, the choreographer. And we had to go to um, Osprey once a week and we rehearsed the, the pulling and we, put, we did so many different versions of pushing and pulling of that buddy routine and um, learning the music and everything, which of course I knew. And it was amazing because originally I was slotted in to sing, I, uh, what was my, um, my line was supposed to be, how long, oh Lord, before you let me die, which is the part I'd sung in the show. And um, it ended up, that line ended up getting cut in the film and they gave me, how long, oh Lord, no, what do you, I know she'll wait, I know that you'll be true. That was my line in the film. So. It was, I was so lucky that I got featured, I get that big solo. They actually used my mine for the Oscars. Oh my goodness, that's, I mean, that must have been su such an incredible They used my line on the Oscars. It. Pardon? Oh, I mean, and then, and then going to see the movie with my mum at Leicester Square, and you suddenly come up, and there, you know, I'd seen all the James Bond films, all the big musical films at Leicester Square, with, and there I am giving it large with my one line. Oh. How incredible. incredible. How incredible. I remember when I went to see it, I was like, oh my God, there's Johnny. You know, it's just, instead of, yes, Johnny, it was, there's Johnny. Just amazing. Just an incredible, yeah. that's an incredible showbiz story, you know, to, 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 to experience that as well. But you've done, you know, I mean, you honestly, your, your CV is phenomenal. I mean, you've, you've obviously done theatre, you know, obviously, as we said, we've just done film, you've done radio, you've done recordings, you've done panto, which is how we met. I mean, I know it's hard to choose. Do you have a particular favourite um, style of performing? Um, no, I, I, I kind of, whatever, it's really funny when people say, what's your favourite show or part? And I go, the part on, or the show I was doing at the time, because I'm, I'm obsessive. I can't think about anything other than that show or that part when I'm doing it. When I, like, particularly as I've got older, when I'm learning a role now, I can't even have the radio on. I literally live and breathe those harmonies, those lines. I just, um, learning has become a very different process as you get older. It becomes yes, harder. it is much harder. I mean, which is, yeah, it, no, it certainly oh. isn't. But, you know, muscle memory isn't what it used to be. And, and that kind of, that whole thing of um, being able to retain um, knowledge and, and just, you know, I mean, and also I think, you know, alluding to the situation that we find ourselves in, you know, lockdown too, is that, it's because all the days kind of morph into each other and it's like, you know, I mean, someday, if I'll be honest with you, I don't even know what day of the week it is. When I'm at work, I've had that structure. I know what, you know, what that is or what day of the week it is. But, but I think it's very hard to kind of, you know, we, we can't sort of plan anything. We can't go out, you know, for the arts industry. I mean, for you as an artist, as a creative, and I know you've kept working because you're, you're so versatile and teaching is your, is your love, but how, you know, how, how has this felt for you? I mean, this must be heartbreaking that, you know, the arts to me has been the industry that has been the least um, looked after in this whole sorry mess. Yeah. And, you know, the arts that brings in so much money to this country and yet it's been sidelined. Does that make you angry? Well, you know, I, 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 I never knew that much money. I didn't know that the the theatre and just the West End alone brings in I was the biggest earner. I didn't realise what the theatre brings in every year. It's extraordinary. And yeah, I do feel angry. And if there's anything I could do about it single-handedly, I would. Yeah, no, I absolutely. really would. But yeah. there's nothing I can... I'm signing every bloody petition there is to sign. Um, you know, I'm doing my bit to support my friends if they're doing online stuff and that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm dying to see, look, I get online, but oh my God, I just want to see people be live in the theatre again. I just kind of, I'm craving some connection again. And, and, and there is, there is no substitute. I mean, you know, doing online is fine and, it, and it, you know, we've, we've learned to be incredibly resourceful, but 
you know, for me as someone who loves the theatre and as a reviewer, and this is the longest I've ever not been to the theatre my whole life. And I mean, I miss it so badly. For you, as for you and your, you know, your your performing friends and colleagues, this must be so hard because you thrive off a live audience. That's that's your yeah. that's what you do, and that must be so hard. You must miss that so terribly. It is. I mean, I've done two online concerts. Um, I did the Godspell, the 50th anniversary of Godspell concert, which I was so honoured to be to be asked to be part of. That um, was with my, Michael England. Quinn. For Michael Quinn and yeah. uh, Tom, uh, Tom Hopkins. And And um, uh, it was amazing, you know. And I got to sing with my best friend, Jenna Russell, and another very dear old friend, Sally Ann Triplett, we did on The Willows. It was a phenomenal cast. Um, Stephen Schwartz was involved. And um, that was great. And then I did a gender swap and I sang, I finally got to sing my version of I'm Changing from Dream Girls. So, which was great. But again, it's also kind of, you do it at home or you go to a studio, but you're just craving that kind of adrenaline rush. That, and you yeah. don't get that at home. If you go, well, I'm at home sitting in my pajamas, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's not that I've got no, a nice shirt on, but I've got my pajamas on underneath, you know? Well, I know. I mean, I, you know, I, I've got I've got a lovely dress on, but I've got my abs on because my feet are freezing. So it's not very glam, is it? <laughs> I don't, do you know, there was a wonderful thing that a friend of mine sent me a couple of weeks ago called the Zoot Suit. So if suddenly you know, you're sitting at home in your pajamas and suddenly the phone goes, it's a business call. It's literally, they've got it for girlies as well. But it's basically, it's a top. It's like a tie and a jacket. And you just come in and go, hi. <laughs> it's, really, it's called the Zoot Suit. I love it. I'm going to get one. <laughs> That, 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 that's such a good idea. I mean, I, I, as a stylist, I'm sort of encouraging, you know, I'm doing a lot of, uh, all, my, all my work is online now. So I'm doing virtual personal styling appointments online. And primarily what I'm doing is just dressing women, you know, for, who are working from home. So it's basically the top up. So amazing blouse is what looks good on Zoom. You know, <laughs> who would have thought it, eh? Who would have thought yes, it? Absolutely. I know. The, the, the Zoom look. <laughs> the Zoom look, absolutely. Um, let's talk yeah. about your love of Lionel Bart. This is this is kind of you are you know John Barr and Lionel Bart are you know the the, the two names are synonymous well, with each other. Well, by doing this project, the show got written for me by my friend Lionel, uh, by um, Simon Hanning about Lionel Bar and approached me about he'd written it for me and then he said read it and I read it and then um and he said well we're doing it in four weeks time and I went four weeks there was 22 songs and I was the only person in the show that spoke it was you know a retrospective and I said to him I think we should get in some special guests to learn some of the other songs I can't learn much in you know and what has happened by doing the show I've become close to si um, Lionel's nephew Sam has just asked me to do demos of his new musical which is incredible and I've got to know Brenda Evans and Muriel Walker, who were Lionel Bart's PA. Muriel is 94 and Brenda is 80 something. They're incredible. They've now become these two incredible women in my life. And I've been to the archives. I've handheld Lionel Bart's original notepad of Oliver. I've held his Tony Award. I've worn his glasses. Um, I mean, it, it's, I never, I, and I met Lionel a few times in my life because I was in Oliver as a kid. In the West End, and he would occasionally and come in. A, and even as a kid, I knew who he was. It was a lovely circle. Oh, though, it, 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 it is. It's extraordinary. But my life has been about that. There are people that, um, Lionel being one of them, but now, I don't know if you, do you know the name Elizabeth Steele? Who? Elizabeth Steele. No, I've not heard of her, no. Well, she, she's my neighbour. She lives about a 10 minute walk away. She won the Tony or whatever Julie Andrews in 1960 on Broadway for a show called Emma LaDuce. Yes, that very and old I show. I saw her in Chicago. Yeah, so I was 14, 13, 14 years of age in Chicago at the Cambridge. And I fell in love with her. And now to think that she is a, like one of my dearest friends, I go over and see her on, you know, I try and see, see her regularly. We go for a walk. There's other people like Sheila Hancock that I've, as I've got older, I've worked with, uh, Di Langton, all these incredible old stalwarts of musical mm. theatre that are now part of my life. I just feel so incredibly blessed. But the Lionel Bart thing, particularly, just having all this, there are things that I've been told that aren't in books. By the nieces, the nephews, um, 
a family members about how, how kind Uncle Mai was or how naughty he was or um, that aren't in the books. I mean, it's just extraordinary. So Simon Hannah, if you're listening to this, I thank you for writing this one because it really has, it's been an incredible vehicle to do. And sadly, we had about 10 shows to do this summer and they all got cancelled. So hopefully next year we'll, we'll do it. God willing, God willing. I mean, it, you know, I mean, Lila Bart's story was, you know, such, such a sad story. Well, you said my, my story, Rags to Riches. I mean, his really was Rags to Riches to Rags. I mean, yeah. I mean he didn't very end up sad. with nothing in the end. I mean, Cameron was very, very kind to him in the end with Oliver the Rights to Oliver in the end. But um, yeah, but the most extraordinary man, you know. It's, but again, it's just opened up a, a whole plethora of friendships and knowledge about, about one man and how my life has changed because of that show. And what, what, I mean, what, as I said, I mean, you've obviously done, say, theatre and panto and radio and, and, and various recordings as well. Um, I guess there's been highlights of all of those things that you've done, that you've stood there and you've had, like, pinch me moments. But, but I know for you, your great love now, and particularly it, it served you in such good stead, and is, is teaching, teaching, imparting your knowledge and your passion to, to students now. You've been doing this for 10 years. Um, I guess this is this has been such a good thing that you've been doing this because now this has been such a useful tool that, you know, you're so versatile, you know, acting is so important, but teaching is your I, love, isn't it? It is. It really, I mean, it, I, it really is a passion. I and mean, if you said to me, if I got offered a teaching job now, I probably would never perform again. I, I mean, I would still sing, but I kind of, and, um, but I don't think I want to quite go down the route of being a teacher 24 seven yet. But I think I can still do that when I get older. Yeah. The thing is, because I didn't train, I, I, and I say this to everyone, and I think you'll get this as well. It, um, every, I've learned by my failures more than my successes. My successes have been great, but I've learned by, for every show that I didn't get, I said this to some students the other day, for every show I didn't get, three months later, I'm sitting in a dressing room, putting a wig and a hat on, going, oh my God, if I'd have got that show, yeah. I wouldn't be here having the best time that this show has changed my life. I've been nominated for a couple of things, the shows that I wouldn't have got if I'd have done other jobs. It's so, so weird, whatever you call that, you know, synchronicity or whatever, you know, it's just, I've been, again, what you said earlier on, been in the right place at the right time. I've made a couple of bad decisions in my life. But that you know what, all. not been bad. Well, yeah, but that's what I say to students. I don't now don't think of anything as being a good experience or a bad experience. Yeah. It's been an experience and it's grown not only as a human being and as a performer. The good thing is as a performer, all those hurts and things that we have, they make me a better actor, you know? I've got all those things to, to touch base with and to be honest about. Absolutely, uh, yeah, and, and I think, you know, it's, it, it's interesting you say that because my son absolutely loves what he does. You know, he loves, he loves um, performing, but he loves teaching, he loves choreography. And I think, you know, that, that way is, probably the way that he will end up, you know, if, if, if things carry yeah. on the way that they are, then, you know, you've got to be able to, you've got to be able to teach. And I think that's so important. So what, yeah. so what's planned for the future? Never... Sorry, carry on. Well, um, I know I, I never thought I'd become a teacher, but as I said, it came, it came my way actually through the name is movie, funny enough, but, um, but the, um, that, that I just love it. And because I, if one student gets one little nugget from me, they can have it. I know I get paid to do it, um, but I, you know, I'm I'm very open about and just ask me questions about my life and because you'll get to. I was always when I worked in companies when I was younger, I was always asking the older actors and the leading players, you know, how have you done this? And I think somehow it's all kind of morphed into now me going right. You need to have this back. Mm. But, uh, you know, as I say, your story is so inspirational and, and, and testament to your hard work and commitment to your craft and honing your craft and, you know, acting through singing is so important. As I say, you, know, you obviously work with Erdang Arts Ed, London School of Music Theatre, London Studio Centre, all, you know, the big names. And, yeah. you know, you, I know it's a big um, honour as well. You, you know, you've been off, you've got, what, what you've got, um, You've been offered, is it, is it like an honorary doctorate from... Um... No, I'm a patron of two colleges. Oh, that's right, um, yeah. I'm, I'm incredibly honoured about, and to, you know, to be a patron as well is to, you know, it kind of, it's another, the kids look up, you mentor them and, and stuff like that, and it's, um, 
yeah, and very, it's a great honor. You know, it's another little nod. It's a bit like, I, I, I never thought I'd ever be nominated for anything. I've been nominated for Assassins for Best Actor and when I played Ed Cleveland in the class act. And that was amazing. I didn't win. But again, you just go, I've now got nominated for two phenomenal roles. And also as a teacher, two of the colleges where I've taught, I've said, would you be one of our, you know, patrons? Up like, well, yeah. People like Carrie Ellis and Alfie Bow and people like that. I'm a patron. So it's, um, but, it's an honour. It's a great honour. It really is. So um, how can we find you on social media and what's coming up next for you? On social media, um, on Instagram and Twitter, I'm John Barr UK, J O H N B A W I UK. And um, next coming up, I'm doing a Christmas concert, which is going to be streamed to all the old age pensioners' homes in East London through the late and um, the late and great town hall, through my friend Simon Hanning, who wrote the Lionel Bart show. And if that can go public, I will let you know, Nancy, because you could maybe post that. But I think Absolutely. that's just going to be an internal thing. Um, the Godspell concert, I believe, is going to be um, aired on Broadway HD pretty soon. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, and I must put on my version of I Am Changing on YouTube. Then people can see that as well. Well, what, what, what we'll try and do is we'll try and attach that to the show, this, this episode. Okay, great. We'll try oh, and do great. That. I'll, send, yeah. I'll send that to you then. Okay, fantastic. Fabulous. Well, honestly, Johnny, it's been such a pleasure. I'm sorry it's been so long, but we know we see each other on the Book of Faith very regularly. And I'm so proud, you know, to, 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 to have known you all these years and, and to see your, you know, your career blossom and, and the fact that you're just imparting this wonderful passion and knowledge to youngsters going forward. They're very lucky to have you as their teacher. So it's been an absolute joy to talk to you. It really, really has. Well, thank you, Nancy, for asking me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for appearing on the Nancy Stevens Show. Thank you. Um, thank, uh, talking to anyone who is anyone in the arts and entertainment world, John Barr, fantastic. Catch my show on all major platforms.